So when you think of the word crunch, you think of something like satisfying, like yeah. getting your teeth into some like a crunchy or something, some food, some food or something, or some, some like a fortune cookie. That's a satisfying crunch because you're expecting yeah. something to come from it. That's, it's that's a tasty a, word. It's a good crunch. It's a, it's a, a crunchy bar, Cadbury's crunchy bars, crunchy nut cereal. That's like the, one of the best crunches you'll see. Good again. crunch. It's a good word, crunch. Some crunches aren't as good. No, no and. Uh, like standing on a snail crunch, you thought that- Oh, that's a terrible you one. You thought that was a bad crunch. Yeah. Nothing compares to this. In the news this week, according to an investigation by the New York Times, video games are destroying the developers that make them. That's right, according to the Times article, the now infamous crunch period, which is a sudden spike in work hours, as many as 20 hours a day that can last days or even weeks, is causing serious problems for the people involved. A host of games developers told the Times how they sleep at work. They limit bathroom breaks by wearing adult diapers and cut out anything that pulls their attention away from their screens like family and food. These people are making video games, remember? Games designer Clint Hocking described suffering memory loss as a result of the stress and anxiety of crunching on a game. Brett Duville, another veteran game programmer, said he once worked so long that he found himself temporarily unable to step out of his car, presumably in like a I can't face another day at the office kind of way, not some kind of sad paralysis or something. You can kind of see him just sitting there. Staring at his wheel. Yeah. Kind of like when I get home in the evening. <laughs> I know my kids are there waiting for me. Don't know how long I can do this anymore. Modern video games like Uncharted have huge budgets amounting to tens of millions and require the labour of hundreds of people, who in some cases can each work 80 to 100 hour weeks. Crunching isn't just restricted to the final period of development on a game, it can happen at any time in the development process, and it can last for several months. The Times points out that programmers and artists alike stay late on weeknights and use weekends to squash bugs, putting the final polish on their characters. Most game developers in the United States don't receive any overtime pay either. They they might gaze with envy at their colleagues in the film industry where unions help regulate hours and ensure overtime pay. In a 2016 survey by the International Game Developers Association, 65% of developers said they'd had to deal with the crunch, with 52 adding that they'd done it more than twice in the previous two years. And Marcin Ivinsky, co-chief executive and co-founder of CD Projekt Red said, quote, people think that making games is easy. It's hardcore work. It can destroy your life. Deep stuff. We all know about crunch. This isn't kind of surprising, except for some of the really specific examples there, like uh, adult diapers and stuff like that. Jesus. You know, we all kind of know that crunch is a thing by now. It's, it's a thing that happens. It's quite infamous. The Times has, has done quite an extensive look at this, and it's, it is pretty crazy reading and we can only recommend that you spend your time doing it where we'll put a link in the description i can't think of many other industries where people are being made to work under these conditions really honestly adult diapers i mean yeah yeah it sounds a bit funny her uh, men walking around and all that but if that's actually happening that is absolutely terrible as soon as this kind of thing stops the better in my eyes we do a lot of complaining on this channel and we always kind of uh, complain about companies and, and publishers specifically let's not that get confused with developers and the people who are actually making it there are two separate things here that we complain about and the publishers are mainly always the ones that we're talking about the people in the boardrooms and the people who are doing it for investors and, and people who are buying into games without actually being involved in it really and uh, we're not talking about the, the average kind of developer the coder the programmer the designer who's busting a gut to just make games under sometimes under terrible terrible conditions also this week in the news there's been a lot of talk about the future of single player games people saying single player is dead and lol no single player is not dead and stuff like that well a lot of that talk came after the closure of Dead Space developer Visceral Games, who were working on a single-player Star Wars project when EA canned the entire studio. And despite widespread worries about what that closure might mean for single-player games in future, one of the now ex-Visceral staff has spoken out on the topic. Zach Wilson, Visceral's senior level designer on Battlefield Hardline, said any talk of the death of single player was quote, totally absurd. EA might not be the company that carries that torch, but there are so many groups out there that are passionate about this kind of game that they won't go away, he said. Personally, I'd like to see fewer games with higher quality across the board, which is probably what will happen. Yeah, that's kind of what I'd prefer to see as well. I think most people would prefer to have fewer great things than a lot of average things I guess and this guy okay his studio was closed down they were working on a single player game but he's kind of come out and said don't be ridiculous single players going nowhere people love making the games people still want to buy the games there's still a market there 
why would they go away? So this is quite encouraging to hear it and it's a good way to, to end the conversation on whether or not single player is dead. Elsewhere in the news, as much as the gaming world has been up in arms about loot boxes, apparently they're having zero impact on the sales of the games that they're in. MPD analyst Matt Piscatella told GamesIndustry.biz this week that there are no signs that sales of AAA games have been impacted by the recent controversy surrounding titles such as Destiny 2, Middle Earth Shadow of War and Forza Motorsport 7. Not surprisingly, FIFA 18 is among the top 10 selling games for 2017, despite its microtransaction based ultimate team mode that earns EA $800 million per year. Piscatella told GamesIndustry.biz that the presence of loot boxes doesn't cause games to sell at higher levels than those without. But he also said the recent controversy hasn't yet resulted in a clear, noticeable depreciation of the sales of the games which have loot boxes in them. Piscatella expects the sales data for the fourth quarter to give a better indication as to whether loot boxes have any impact on sales. October's sales data should shed more light on how much impact loot boxes are actually having on sales given the controversy surrounding Middle Earth Shadow of War and Forza Motorsport 7. For my money, as much as I, I don't trust the guy called Piscatella, because you know, I, I've seen Orange is the New Black and I know you don't trust them is if it's probably Piscatellas. The, yeah, you don't trust the Piscatellas. It's far too early to tell whether it is having an impact because he's talking about games that were released in the beginning of September. Now this whole loot box controversy for me kicked off around mid-September, end of September, and largely this month. It, I think that the amount of awareness that's being shared on these types of things has only happened in the last few weeks, basically, and that is not enough time for that information to kind of take hold in people's minds and for them to make decisions based on the fact that there's uh, microtransactions or not. So he's talking about games that were released before all this shit got kicked up, basically. It's going to be Shadow of War and Star Wars Battlefront 2, isn't it? They're going to have to look at those sales after Christmas uh, and see if there's been any impact, because those are the two really, really big controversial conversations that we've been having about loot boxes online, anyway. Also this week, Bethesda has decided it's going to give out review copies again, so that's nice. Cast your minds back to last year when Doom came out, and Bethesda kind of used it as a test case for its new policy of not giving out review codes to journalists before a game comes out. They tried to camouflage the extreme anti-consumer idea by saying they wanted everyone to experience the game for the first time at the same time. But that line was also a sneaky little PR move by subtly pitting journalists and gamers against each other with the idea, why should journalists get games early? Well, so the gamers can get proper reviews in time for day one, you f***ing snakes. Anyway, after sticking to that policy with the release of games like Skyrim Remastered over the last year, the company has decided to double back and give journalists review code before launch for this week's release of Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus. Confirming the news on Twitter, IGN journalist Dan Stapleton said, quote, they're back to giving out copies a few days early. Not as far in advance as I'd like, but a big improvement. Okay, so this is a, a nice little turnaround here. It's very quietly done, but I guess how else would they do it? I guess they wouldn't announce like, ta-da, we're Must actually up, yeah. 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 fixing their mistake, because that is what it was. Like Dan Stapleton said, ideally they'd be giving the code out earlier so the journalists have more time before launch and you get a nice situation where there's a good week or so of reviews before the game comes out. That is what you want, really. At least they are giving the game at some point before the game comes out now, which is a huge improvement over holding it back until launch day. And another headline from this week, a star college basketball player in the US is out injured after breaking his hand playing basketball in a video game. NCAA and North Carolina Tar Heels senior point guard Joel Berry II broke his right hand last week by punching a door after losing a game of NBA 2K18 to a teammate Theo Pinson. Nerd rage. The guy is out injured from a real sports over nerd rage. North Carolina coach Roy Williams told ESPN, quote, he did a silly thing. That's what it was. One of his greatest characteristics is his competitiveness. Turning something negative into a positive there. It's like, work, like a proper coach would. A little PR line there, well done. Berry was awarded the title of most outstanding player for the Final Four last season and helped lead the UNC Tar to the national title. Which I'm sure is very good. I don't understand a lot of those words. No, not basketball fans here. This is our intern Isaac who wrote this, who's, I, I guess, a basketball correspondent. He's even been tipped for a move to the professional game. Williams told ESPN that he's uncertain how long Barry will be out, but the initial prognosis was injured for four weeks for nerd rage. We all get angry playing games sometimes, right? But imagine we got so upset that we... Got injured from our professional sports careers. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, was, I was trying to equate that to us. Like, what do we need? Like, yeah. he needs his hands. What do we need? Our legs, I guess. <laughs> 
Because we're stood here, we could be... Uh, yeah. If, mean... if we ever come in sitting on a stool presenting this show, then you know it's because we, we, we kick the door and we can't stand up. That's to be fair, hands are like most jobs, and you up your hands, like, what? Not much work that you can do, really, That's is true. it? It definitely is no coincidence that it was a game that got that includes microtransactions, so... I mean, if I'm going to get be... angry over anything, it's going to be a game with microtransactions. Yeah, it was, it was, it was going to happen. So what is the funniest nerd rage story that you've ever heard? Let us know down in the comments below. Like the video if you've enjoyed it, subscribe if you're new around here, there's another video to watch now on your screen there. Support us on Patreon if you're awesome, we'll see you again in the next video. Bye for now.